problem is, I always like to see the sin in the other guy. It's always easy for me to notice when somebody else does something wrong. It is a little more difficult for me to be accepting and say, well, you know what? There go I also. And I think that's not unfortunately unique to just us. It's been that way all along. And the story that we're going to look at today in the Bible is one that I have had some trouble with because I've heard people quote this scripture. And they're real good about quoting the scripture and leaving out the last sentence when it comes to trying to rationalize and justify sin. The title of my message today is Sin and Judging Others. And I want to understand this scripture a little better, perhaps, when we're done with it than when we just started. The scripture we're looking at is John 8, verses 1 through 11. It says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning he came again to the temple. All the people came to him and sat down and, taught, and he taught them. The scribes and Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to her, him, Teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now in the law, Moses commanded us to stone such a woman. So what do you say? They said this to test him, so they might have some charge to bring against him. Jesus bent down and wrote his finger on the ground. And as he continued to ask him, he stood up and said to them, Let him who is without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more he bent down and wrote on the ground. And when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones. And Jesus was left with the woman standing before him. And Jesus stood up and said to her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, No one, Lord. And Jesus said, Neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. Now this is a setup pure and simple. The Pharisees and the scribes want to discredit Jesus. And knowing how Jesus preaches redemption and forgiveness, they thought this is the perfect example. A woman caught, definitely breaking the law. He is going to have to look at this from a strictly black and white situation. And he's going to have to condemn her, which will undo his message of forgiveness and and I will suggest to you that that's the way we like to do things. I am very much aware of other people's sin, but I'm also very much willing to look the other way on my own sin. The reason this is a setup, I believe, and many others do also, is you know that it's just the woman they bring before Jesus. Now, I don't know about you, but for adultery, I think there has to be somebody else present. Now, there are some who have argued that this guy was a big guy, and so the scribes and Pharisees didn't want to mess with him. There have been others that argued that this is just a woman that they wanted to deal with, and they set her up. And whatever the case may be, it's the woman only that comes before Jesus. And I think... There's a few points we need to acknowledge. First and foremost, what this woman did was wrong. By Mosaic law, she deserved to be stoned to death. God takes adultery seriously. It is not an excusable crime. It's not a sin that Jesus will go, oh, oh well, it's not that bad. Your heart was in the right place. We sometimes, and especially today, I see this scripture quoted many times to rationalize and justify sin. See, Jesus had a sinner, and he said, oh, well, go away. It's no big deal. They do that, like I say, without acknowledging his last sentence. When it says, neither do I condemn you. Go on from now on, sin no more. Jesus is not condoning her sin. Jesus is not allowing that sin to be okay. He is acknowledging it that was sin. In fact, he would have acknowledged, because he acknowledged the Mosaic law, that by law she deserved to be stoned. The fact that Jesus did not condemn her 
speaks to God's grace and love and desire to heal us from our sin. You cannot pick and choose the sins that are sin and the sins that you choose to acknowledge and say, well, this isn't so bad. We have to accept that sin is sin. But we also have to acknowledge, as these scribes and Pharisees found when Jesus started to kneel down and write in the dirt, that you and I and they are all sinners as well. I can always look at someone else's sin and say, man, how destructive, how terrible, how rotten that person is. And then get very much blinder vision when it comes to my own sin. I can start to rationalize it, justify it. I can suddenly start finding reasons and ways that I can say, well, this isn't as bad. Oh, it may not be acceptable, but it's, it's, you know, it's not as bad as that. So as long as I'm not as bad as that, I'm okay. And we've been doing that for quite some time. In fact, we've been doing it since man first began. When Adam and Eve were confronted about eating the forbidden fruit, Adam's excuse was, well, the woman you gave to me coerced me into talk, eating that fruit. It's not really my fault, it's her fault. And that's the problem. We want our sin to be lesser than the other guys. But Jesus does not give us an out there. In Matthew 5, verses 27 through 28, since we're talking about adultery, Jesus decided to get a little bit more, shall we say, uncomfortable. And he says, you have heard it said, you shall not commit adultery. But I say to you that anyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Now I suddenly get very uncomfortable because I could be one of those scribes and Pharisees saying this woman was caught doing something that deserves to be stoned. And I'm okay, the law is the law. Black and white, we do what we gotta do. But when Jesus tells me that just looking can give me the same penalty, suddenly I have a different view. Suddenly I find myself off of that high point where I thought I was better than they were and realize that I'm not only not better than them, but I'm just as bad. When Jesus wrote in that dirt, and there's all this speculation as to what he wrote, and I, some people suggest that he wrote dates and times and addresses where these scribes and Pharisees would remember and go, oh, that one's mine. Yeah, that, I did that one. I did this. Jesus wrote in the dirt to remind them that they were not one iota better than this woman that they were bringing to be stoned. And I find it interesting that the oldest left first, perhaps because, because they're older, they have a lot more sin. And it didn't take them as long to recognize themselves in that writing as the youngsters did. And perhaps they understood scriptures well enough to know that when Jesus started to confront them, that they truly had to admit, yes, I am a sinful person as well. We cannot look at other people's sin, condemn them, and piously look down on them without acknowledging first that I too am a sinner. I am a broken person. I need forgiveness as much as they do and in some cases perhaps more than they do. Now today's world, they want to read that scripture and they go, see Jesus had a situation where the law said she was wrong, but Jesus said, no, I don't condemn you. Go ahead and go on. They want to leave out the words, go and sin no more. Because what they want to do is to imply that Jesus is saying, it's okay what you did. You were, in fact, in love after all. So this adulterous affair really wasn't all that bad because, hey, your feelings matter. And, you know, as long as you love the guy, it's okay. 
That's what the world would suggest to you. And as I said, it is not accurate when you look at that scripture in that way. If you take those words that Jesus said away, you can breed all sorts of crazy, stupid theology into that. Jesus said, go and sin no more. He was not giving her permission to continue. He was not giving her his approval of her actions. He was saying, you are guilty, and I, because I am the Son of God, can and will forgive you, but I also call you to sin no more. It sort of reminds me of a guy who got pulled over for running a stop sign. And the police officer said, you know, I stopped you for running a stop sign. And the guy goes, you know, I slowed down. I looked both ways. I don't see what the difference is. The police officer says, well, I get a, I've ended up way of explaining that to you if you want me to do that. And the guy's, yeah, sure, explain it to me. He says, well, I'm going to get you out of the car, and I'm going to beat you with my nightstick. And you can either ask me to stop completely or just slow down. Which would you rather I did? You see, we want to be the guy running the stop sign. I want to be told to slow down when the law says I need to stop. I want to be able to sin and rationalize and justify it. But then I want it right to look at others and go, uh, you crossed a line. You deserve to be stoned. You are the problem in this world. And not look at my own sin. We must, as we look at sin, recognize it for what it is. That woman committed adultery. In the book of the law, the Old Testament, she was worthy of being killed for that sin. Now, in today's world, that seems a little harsh. But God takes that seriously because the marriage relationship is the mere relationship of Jesus Christ to his church. And anything that distracts from that relationship distracts from Jesus Christ's relationship with you and I. So Jesus takes that sort of thing very, very seriously. Even though today I can find plenty of people in the world who will tell you, nope, it's not a big deal. Just do what you want to do. If it feels good, do it. And they'll tell you. They'll take scriptures like this out of context and say, see, Jesus said it was okay. Make no mistake, Jesus never said what she did was okay. He never condoned it. He never accepted it as approvable behavior. He considered it a sin. Hence the reason he said, go and sin no more. Now, I want that sin in others to be clear. I'm not so comfortable with it being in myself. Make no mistake, sin will earn you an address in hell. I don't like saying that, but especially in this day and age when sin is so rationalized, so justified, so allowed in the world, I have to tell you, sin is going to get you an address in hell. The Bible puts it clearly, the wages of sin are death both a physical and a spiritual death. That's the black and white part of the law. You sin, you die, you go to hell. It's that simple. And if I left you there, this would be a very depressing message. And we would have no reason to be here. But just like this woman, we too can come before Jesus Christ, repent, Put away our sins and ask for forgiveness. We can turn our lives around. The fact that I am a sinner does not keep me from being able to come before God 
and ask for that forgiveness. It does not keep me from being able to say, Lord, I have messed up. It does require me to reject the world's view that says, oh, it's okay. I can find a good reason why you did what you did. And if it's a good rational reason, then it's okay what you did. My friends, there is no rationalization for sin. There never was, there never will be. Satan will lie as he did with Adam and Eve. When they ate of the fruit, he says, you will not die. Well, they both brought death into the world and also a spiritual death. God's law was held up. The wages of sin are death. I remember some of you may have heard of a guy named Dr. David Jeremiah. He is a well-known biblical teacher that does a radio program. He's taught for years. And when he was a young man just coming out of seminary, he was giving a sermon that was going to be critiqued by one of his older instructors. And after the sermon, David Jeremiah came up to him and says, you know, what did you think? And the pastor says, you know, your content was good, you're, you're factual, you kept biblical to what you preached, you, should do, you, you did well on the sermon, except... And you know, whenever somebody says except or but, you just know that what they're about to say is going to disqualify everything you said before. And the instructor says, if you're telling people they're going to hell, you should not look like you enjoy that idea. And I think there's a truth to that that David Jeremiah learned that day, and I remember that story so that I will remember it that day. The fact that we live in a world full of sin and sinners going to hell should not please the Christian church. We should not sit here piously going, well, too bad for them guys. At least we're forgiven. The sin of others should break our hearts. The sin of others should cause us to reflect. And I think too often we want to have the good news of Jesus Christ while we reject the sin of others and the ability for them to seek salvation. It's also important to remember that sin is not a past tense for a Christian. I can tell you about sins I did 30, 40 years ago. And it's amazing how easy it is to talk about those sins now. You know, when I was a teenager and I did stupid things, I could sit there and say, yeah, I was a dumb teenager and I did this and it's okay. But the truth of it is, the sin I'm going to commit this afternoon isn't so easy to talk about. It isn't so easy to acknowledge. And for a Christian, one of the truths about sin is, it will not always be past tense. Just because I have accepted Christ, ask Him for forgiveness, does not mean that this day I will not do something that brings me before the Lord again and go, Lord, looks like I blew it again. My temper got the better of me. I got angry. I looked at somebody with lust. I did whatever it was. And the truth of the matter is, salvation is for people who have strayed away from God. And you and I are just in much of need as that sinner that's laying out in the gutter. I would rather prefer that we didn't need him as much as that guy out in the gutter. But my friends, we are all sinners. We are all required to come before God and say, I'm not where I should be. I have failed in ways that I should not have. I wish I could have been better. One of the great preachers of the 1600s a man of name John Bradford made a statement once that as he was watching a bunch of sinners being led to execution, said, there but for the grace of God goes John Bradford. What John Bradford understood is that without God's grace, without his forgiveness, he deserved execution as much as those individuals that were about to be executed. 
He understood his own guilt. He understood the price that Jesus Christ paid on that cross. My friends, sometimes we look at that cross and we look at evil, terrible people and we go, yeah, Jesus paid a terrible price for them. But he also paid a terrible price for you and me. We do not want to focus on that. Jesus Christ showed a woman 2,000 years ago compassion and forgiveness and instructed her, go and sin no more. We today, as a Christian church, must call sin, sin. Even within the church, I see a lot of desire to take sin out of the vocabulary, to take certain sins and make them a little better than others. They're just a different alternate lifestyle. They're just a different thing, way of looking at things. It amazes me in 2022, as I look at the world and I see things like pedophilia being rationalized and justified. As an old man, and I'm only 66, so some of you are laughing when I say old man, I cannot imagine a world where that argument even stands a chance to be spoken, let alone followed. And yet in this world, that is exactly what's going on. If we do not turn away from our evil ways, we should not be shocked by what the world will justify, rationalize. Sin is sin. And each and every one of us is a sinner. Each and every one of us is necessary to come before God and beg for forgiveness for our own sin. I cannot anymore sit in judgment over another person than you can over me. We are all individuals who must come before our Lord and say, Lord, I have failed. I have fallen. We don't get a follow-up with this woman. It'll be interesting when I get to heaven and have all knowledge to find out what happened. It is my hope that he, she, or she heeded God's word and said, go sin no more. That she received forgiveness and she took that forgiveness to heart and turned to God. She had a choice. She could do that or she could reject God's forgiveness and go back into sin. You and I have also got a choice today. The same exact choice. We can heed God's warning we can flee from our sin and repent of the sin that we have and say, Lord, take this out of my life. Or we can just shrug our shoulders and say, oh, well. The writing in that dirt that day set all of the accusers going away. My friends, I suggest to you that in 2022, we let the Holy Spirit cast our eyes down to the dirt below our feet and see the sins that he will reveal to us that we need to repent of. And when they are revealed to us, unlike the scribes and Pharisees who went away quietly, unrepented, we should fall at Jesus' knees and say, Lord, forgive me, for I desire to sin no more. This message, like I said, has been misused time and time again to rationalize and justify sin. And the one thing about the Bible that is very clear and is something that we must understand is the Bible does not conflict with itself. It does not call something a sin in one place and then allow it in another. God is God. The God of the Old Testament. The God of Judges. The God that called a annihilation of the evil people is the same God who lives today, who offers forgiveness to those who will seek it. But make no mistake, just like those nations that were destroyed in the Old Testament, should we refuse that forgiveness? Should we piously look at others and say, well, I'm not as bad as they are, so I'm okay. 
then we will suffer our sin. We will be punished. We will find our eternity in hell. Even though we consider our sin lesser than theirs. It's a terrible thing to be in a world full of sin and people trying to convince you that that's okay. Don't worry about it. Because my Bible says, definitely worry about sin. The wages of sin are death. And my friends, someone died for you so that you could be forgiven. Let not his death be taken in vain because we reject that gift and follow our sin instead. Thank you.